Hi guys, it's Design Teacher here with a, another video. This time I hope to go through the whole topic of B10, which is the human nervous system. This topic is quite a small one, uh, however there is a lot more triple content in there than combined content. So remember if you are a combined science student, you will not have to watch the whole video and I will remind you at the point you are at uh, so that you can stop watching. Hope you enjoy the video and remember if you do like it, please drop it a like and subscribe to the channel. The topic of the nervous system falls kind of in a subcategory of the whole topic of homeostasis. So to start this uh, video off, what we're going to look at is what homeostasis is and why it's important. In a nutshell, homeostasis is the control of internal environment. So what actually needs to be controlled in our body in order to stay safe? Well, the things that we need to control are temperature, blood glucose levels, and the water content in our body. And we control these all subconsciously. And that just means that we don't have to think about them. And they work by a mechanism called a negative feedback system. And what this basically means is that it will detect a change, then it will try and combat that change, and it's continuously moving. For example, if you are too cold, what will happen is you will start to shiver uh, and also you might notice when you're cold your veins leave the surface of your skin and that will mean that you start to warm up. Now once you become too warm you will then start to sweat, your veins will return to the surface of your skin to lose heat and you will become colder and this is the negative feedback system working. Now, for a negative feedback to start, there must be a change in the environment. And we call this change in, in the environment a stimulus. And, and stimuli are picked up by things in our body called receptors. And these are just there to detect changes in the environment. Then what happens is uh, our coordination centre, and we'll talk a bit more about coordination centres uh, in a bit, they issue a response which is carried out by effectors. The central nervous system is a great example of one of these coordination centres that I said I would talk about. And it basically works on the principle of once we've detected a change of environment through our receptors, how do we elicit what response we are going to make? How do we get it to the brain where we can coordinate what response uh, we should take? So once a change in, in the environment has been detected by the receptors, what we need to do is we need to turn that into an electrical signal. And electrical tr signals travel through the body through neurons. And these pass on and carry electrical signals. Now. Our body is made up of two main types of neurons. The first one is sensory neurons. And the sensory neurons are attached to the receptors. And the sensory neurons carry the electrical signal to the spinal cord. And the spinal cord then sends this signal all the way up it to the brain. Now, once it's reached the brain, the brain creates a response and that response is, response is uh, called your reaction time. You can actually carry out reaction time uh, tests using a ruler. Uh, if you want to learn more about how to carry out a reaction test, uh, refer to my required practicals video for paper two and reaction times is one of them required practicals. But once your brain has figured out a response, it needs to send that signal back to the effectors. And that signal is carried by motor neurons, the other type of neuron, and before being sent to the effectors where 
that response is carried out. And that response could be, for example, shivering. It could be muscles uh, that are told to shiver, for example. There are things that can lower our reaction time and make our brain act a bit slower. For example, uh, you might drink alcohol or uh, you could have other depressants such as cannabis, which would uh, slow your reaction time down. You can also increase your reaction time though by taking stimulants such as caffeine, which can make your brain work a bit quicker and increase your reaction time. So we know now that electrical signals are passed through our body through electrical signals with our neurons. But what happens when we get to the edge of a neuron and it needs to pass that information on to another neuron? We get a gap and that gap is called a synapse. And it just simply is a gap between two neurons. But how does the electrical signal travel between the gap? Well, what happens is that electrical signal is turned into a chemical signal. before being turned back in to an electrical signal. And the reason why synapses do this is because it makes the system a lot more quicker. Now synapses are really cool and you can go into lots of depth at describing them. However, for your GCSEs, this is all you need to know. What happens if your body doesn't have time to send the electrical signal all the way through the central nervous system to the brain and get the brain to think about it to elicit your response. Well, it can bypass the whole system and these things are called reflexes. And you've probably had a, a lot of reflexes before and experienced this yourself. Maybe you've lifted a hot plate out of the oven before and noticed that you dropped the plate and you didn't think about it, uh, but that happened because your reflexes told you to drop it. Um, and the way that these reactions happen, an example could be a pin pricking your skin here. It travels through the sensory neurom just like last time. This time it hits the spinal cord though and doesn't go up the spinal cord to the brain. So it decides not to do that. It skips that out, goes through to the motor neuron and back to your effector. So if you have a real quick response, it misses out brain so you don't have to think about these responses and the key reason for this is because it's a lot quicker to do so. If you are doing combined science you can stop there well done for watching so much of the video if you are doing triple science there is only a little bit left for you to watch and the first bit of this is looking at the brain. And we now know that the brain can be split into different parts as shown in this diagram. However, this was not always the case. It took until around the 1860s for scientists to actually start to think that the brain is split into different parts. We knew that the brain was part of our central nervous system because of the fact uh, in the early 18th century, scientists had electrified different parts of the brain and it showed that muscles would contract when you had done so. However, it was not understood that the brain was separated into different parts until around 1860, when a man called Phineas Gage, uh, he had an iron rod that went through his brain and he was obviously expected to die from this. However, he survived. And that was because of the fact that the part of the brain uh, that controls movement and things like that, that wasn't damaged and he could still speak because the part of the brain that controls speech wasn't damaged. Um, and this made scientists think, ah, the brain must be divided into different sections if he can still carry out these roles even though he has had a metal bar through his head. We now know what the different parts of the brain actually control as well. For example, the main bulk of our brain is called the cerebral cortex. And the cerebral cortex controls all of our conscious thoughts. And that's why our human brains are so large is because of the fact it's mainly made up of the cerebral cortex. And that's the main difference between human brains and animal brains a lot of the time is our cerebral cortex is a lot larger. And down here we have the medulla, 
which controls all of our unconscious thoughts. So it controls things like our heartbeat or breathing. Things we don't have to think about just happen already. Now, how do we know which parts of the brain are responsible for different activities? One way we can investigate this is by doing MRI scans. This is magnetic resonance imaging. And what you can do is stimulate a part of the brain uh, by maybe making you uh, move and you would see the cerebrum is active during this. Or make someone think, make them do a sum and you'll see the cerebrum cortex uh, is the part of the brain uh, that is currently active at that time. You can also send electrical impulses uh, to that part of the brain and see what response you get. So for example, if you send an electrical impulse to the cerebrum, you will notice that uh, different muscles in your body are activated. Another way you can uh, see which part of the brain's function uh, is active is by looking at strokes. Now, when you have a stroke, that's when you have lack of oxygen to the brain. And you can see which part of the brain has been affected by looking at where that stroke has taken place using an MRI scan and looking at the symptoms that that patient has. For example, they might be struggling to speak uh, and you, you might therefore uh, be able to see uh, what part of the brain is responsible by using that MRI scan and uh, looking at which part of the brain has been damaged. The last part of the topic focuses on a specific sensory organ, which is the eye. And the eye contains lots of different receptors that are sensitive to light, intensity and colour. We need to know what the different parts of the eye actually do, though. And some key ones include the cornea, which is located here. And the cornea is responsible for refracting light that enters. Then we also have the iris which is here and the iris uh, controls how much light enters your pupil. Then you have the lens which further refracts the light. You have the retina which detects the light as it's a receptor and then we have the optic nerve and this carries the impulse to the brain and then we also have something else we need to know about is the sclera which is the white layer that's basically uh, just to protect you might have noticed if you look at something really really bright your the size of your uh, pupil changes and this is controlled by the muscles in the iris. And this is called a reflex reaction. So we don't think about it. Uh, it just happens. The brighter the light, the smaller the pupil goes. And this is just to protect your eye. When we're looking at things that are far away or things that are close, our eye needs to change its shape uh, in order to focus the object. So to focus on a near object, what our eye does is it will make the lens thicker and this allows more light rays to refract and therefore the object becomes more clear. However, if the object is far away, the lens becomes thinner, which means less light. That is all you need to know for this topic. I hope you have enjoyed it. Please remember if you did to like the video and subscribe to the channel.